underground organizations such as the Committee for Union and Progress, but they became more commonly known as the Young Turks. These revolutionaries believed that for the Ottoman Empire to survive, it needed to reform and adapt to a new world where it would take its equal place amongst European empires. So, uh, to actually deal with a small mistake that is often made in this video, it's kind of nitpicky, but it actually makes a bit big difference. Um, just because people are Young Turks doesn't mean that they are Unionists. So, like, Amongst the Young Turks, there were also like Ottoman liberals, uh, the Dutch Nocturne, Arab nationalists, you name it, everybody who was opposed to Abdul Hamid II's absolute rule was basically Young Turk, but that doesn't mean that they were all Unionists. Up by Greeks, Armenians, Albanians, Macedonians, and Arabs. Within all this mess, the Young Turks seized the opportunity to seize power in 1908. The Sultan was forced into signing away all political power and reinstate a constitution. The Ottoman Empire became a constitutional monarchy, but in no way became a democratic society. This is actually one of my major annoyances with his video, and this is actually why I always recommend books over YouTube videos, even over this YouTube video. Um, he makes a big claim without actually saying like what he means by it. He says that the Ottoman society didn't become a democratic society, but yeah, I mean like that can mean everything. So I mean like what does he mean by it? But you know, throughout the video he will make bigger claims than that. Uprising in Albania foreshadowed what was to come in the following decade. After crushing the rebellion, the Young Turk government banned the Albanian language, Albanian alphabet, Albanian schools, and Albanian traditional dress. By 1913, I couldn't find anything about this. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comment section. The only thing that I did manage to find about it is in uh, Ferris Ahmed's book, The Young Turks and the Ottoman Nationalities, uh, who has like a devoted chapter to, you know, the problems with the Albanian minority. And he talks about, you know, like the clashes between the central government and the rural Albanian minority, but even he doesn't really talk too much about you know like a cultural genocide or whatever i mean he basically just talks about you know conflict about how centralized the ottoman government should be but other than that i didn't read anything about uh you know some kind of cultural genocide anyways if anybody knows anything about it, please correct me in the comment section. The Young Turks became increasingly racist over time, looking down on Arabs, Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians and Alawites with increasing racialized contempt as a people who supposedly refused to become part of the modern world or as a foreign and enemy entity from within. With passing time, they became increasingly volatile and also delusional. Enver Pasha dreamt of a great Turkic empire stretching from the Balkans to China that he would conquer for a unified ethnically Turkish empire. If you have watched this video, you would have known that he devotes quite a while, you know, quite a bit to uh, the Ottoman massacres of Bulgarian Christians. Um, and, you know, he... Um, wraps that into his video and explains that how that justified Russian intervention into the Ottoman Empire. Yet, when we are talking about the ex, you know, radicalization of the Ottoman government, which happened because of the massacres, massacres against Muslims in the Balkan Wars before the First World War, he seems to mention it nowhere. Luckily, we also have like actual historians such as Mikhail Reynolds, uh, who can help us more with understanding what actually happened um, in the Ottoman, you know, into the mind of the Ottoman leadership. Now, obviously, the Balkan Wars were a traumatization for the Ottoman leadership. But at the same time, if you read the text, uh, I will, you can post the video and uh, read it for yourself because, I mean, it's certainly worth reading. Um, you will also realize that he mentions how the Ottomans and the Bulgarians in the First World War uh, fought side by side together. So, I mean, like, even though they were traumatized because of the Balkan Wars, because of the, you know, massacres against the Muslims, um, this didn't mean that politics were determined by their emotions. And this is a quite, you know, this is actually a quite important aspect, which we will return on later. Young Turks aligned themselves with the German Empire, dressed like German officers and generals, and saw the German Empire as an exemplar model for how to build their new empire. As such, they helped drag the empire into the First World War, which first and foremost exposed one thing, their incompetence. I mean, 
I'm not sure if it's just me, but I kind of have like this issue throughout the entire video, namely that I'm not just not even understanding what he's trying to say. I mean, like, is he trying to say that because the Ottomans looked up to the Germans that they joined the Germans because of that? Because that doesn't make sense whatsoever. So uh, to read a little piece of uh, Shattering Empires that completely shatters the narrative that the Ottomans were seeking some kind of imperial revival or imperial glandor during the First World War, they nurtured no illusions about the relative power of the Ottoman state. Difficult though it must have been for them, they recognized that their homelands had been lost for good. They were not dreamers, but cunning, resolute and desperate men from whom the idea of a last stand was no romantic abstraction. They and their families had, this, had tasted the stain of imperial decline. Despite their efforts and those of earlier generations of Ottoman statesmen to stabilize their empire, they saw what remained crashing down around them and basically, eventually, try to do whatever was necessary to save the state. So, please stop using this uh, ridiculous theory again about how, you know, the Ottomans were thinking about some kind of pan-Islamic, pan tyrannic empire. Russia had the genius idea of invading Russia without preparing for the Russian winter, with predictable results. He came back and instead of taking responsibility, blamed the Armenians. So again, instead of uh, listening to such a clownish interpretation, let's see what an actual historian has to say about the events. As bad as it was, the disaster of Sarukam, which later acquired mythical proportions as part of an effort to discredit the Unionist and Enver in particular, this Enver's decision to launch a wintertime offensive with ill-clothed troops in the mountains is often presented as the epitome of stupidity and fanaticism. Total Ottoman losses were crippling, but closer to 60,000 than the 130,000, 140,000 of popular legend. One explanation advanced for Enver's otherwise seemingly ineffable heedlessness for entering both the war and the offensive at Sarkomish is a deep-seated panturonism, a grand desire to unite the Turkic and Muslim people of the Caucasus, Russia and Central Asia with those of the Ottoman Empire. Such an explanation is not convincing. As noted earlier, Ottoman mobilization plans deployed the army in the west, not on the Caucasus, Caucasian front, despite the fact that an invasion of the Caucasus was the most obvious and straightforward way to bring the war to Russia, and were settled on a Caucasian offensive only after discarding, for geographic and logistical reasons, other options of attack through the Balkans or across the Black Sea. The military stalemate in Europe led Germany and Austro-Hungary to press the Ottomans to launch an offensive against Russia sooner. The tactical blunder committed by Enver at Sarkomish emphasized so often to underscore the alleged irrational pull of panturanism upon Enver and the Ottomans in general is less remarkable when compared with the records of British, French and German generals fighting on the Western Front in France, who sacrificed far greater numbers of lives over a longer period of time for no strategic advantage. The concept of encircling Russian units at uh, Sarkamish and cutting them off from their rear was daring, but not hair-brained, and, and, and in accord with standard military doctrine. There were big differences between him and the other mostly Young Turk officers. Most importantly, he was not a Young Turk. Neither did he believe in their ideas and plans. The Everybody knows you never go full retard. You went full retard, man. And here it goes from clownish to completely ridiculous. So, I mean, like, you folks probably know those times where you were in high school and you had to read a book, which you probably didn't read, but you still went to school the next day nevertheless, hoping you could magically answer all the questions asked by your teacher about the book, who after a few questions quickly realizes you didn't read a single page of it. Well, that's exactly, exactly what we realize right now. I mean, Ataturk was part of the Committee of Unity and Progress. He was part of the Young Turk Revolution. His ent entire political philosophy that you will see later in the Turkish Republic during the establishment of the Turkish Republic was basically, you know, completely derived from the Young Turk philosophy in its com 
you know, in its totality, saying that Atatürk had nothing to do with the Young Turks or the Committee of Unity and Progress is kind of like saying that Nasser had nothing to do with Pan-Arabism or that Che Guevara had nothing to do with the Cuban Revolution. I mean, this is so completely ridiculous. If anyone still can, with a straight face, say that this guy has actually done his homework on Turkish history, has done his homework on Atatürk and his life or his personal life, whatever, I mean, like, I don't know what else to say, my man. The big differences between him and the other mostly Young Turk officers. Most importantly, he was not a Young Turk. Neither did he believe in their ideas and plans. The Young Turks mainly looked for their inspiration on how to reform the empire to the German Empire and to German nationalism as something to copy. The strict militaristic state hierarchy of what was basically a military dictatorship was in their opinion the only way to save the Ottoman Empire. Mustafa Kemal, however, disagreed. He was more interested in what he had seen in France, in particular the French Republic. He saw the pluralistic political system of the French Republic and its desire for progress and advancement in society and the sciences as a better model to copy. He learned to read and speak French, and as such, while the Young Turks read the translations of Prussian militarists, Mustafa Kemal preferred reading the works of French revolutionary and Enlightenment philosophers. In particular, his favourite one, Auguste Comte. A positivist who strictly rejected all forms of metaphysical thought, advocated for the advancement of society in thinking and actions reasoned and based on scientific facts and research, and in particular, advocated for mankind to liberate itself by abandoning all forms of religious ballast and superstition. Gen so again, as I mentioned uh, at the start of my video, he constantly conflates the Young Turks with the U Committee of Unity and Progress. Well, he shouldn't do it, but anyways, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I will just refer to the Committee of Unity and Progress. But here he also makes the mistake by saying that, you know, Atatürk wasn't part of the Committee of Unity and Progress, yet the Committee of Unity and Progress was influenced by you know, German nationalistic ideals, whereas Atatürk's ideals were like, you know, originated from Auguste Comte's, uh, you know, ideas, which is, which doesn't make sense if you actually think about it, because the name, the Committee of Unity and Progress, Unity and Progress, actually comes from Comte's, you know, Auguste Comte's motto, L'Ordre et Progrès. So, which is the name that they took when Atatürk was still three years old. So the Community of Unity and Progress already embraced Auguste Comte when Atatürk was still, you know, was still three years old. So, I mean, like, he does, he makes such big mistakes that anyone who has, you know, some kind of basic knowledge about Atatürk's life and, you know, late Ottoman history wouldn't make such mistakes. So, I mean, again, this is just another sign how he completely, you know, just... He made this video purely out of sensationalism, sensationalism and not because he actually cares about it. It was taken against many of the Ottoman officials who had partaken in the Armenian Genocide in the defeated Ottoman Empire. This was demanded by the Allies and also endorsed by Mustafa Kemal who wrote It is our main wish that the rule of law be applied impartially and that complete justice begins. Since the responsibility in our country is equally shared by young and old, the punishment should not only remain on paper, thereby remaining only propaganda which can lead to many unnecessary discussions, but should be carried out, since this would successfully impress the foreign element. The court-martials set up by the Istanbul and Ankara governments were, however, lackluster, designed in a way that cabinet members could influence outcomes and sentencing, and many of those involved managed to escape punishment. But I mean, first of all, you don't even need to take those, that quote seriously, because, I mean, there is no source, there is no reference. I mean, he just... He doesn't even talk about the Armenians, so I mean, like, he just pulls, an out, pulls a quote out of his ass and he just connects this to, you know, Atatürk said this allegedly about the Armenians. I mean, like, that's not how history works. I mean, like, you need sources, you need, re you need references, you need valid sources. And I actually have some valid sources, which is, you know, a good paper on, you know, to realize or to get 
to understand what Ataturk actually thought what happened to the Armenians, which is called uh, Rida and Mustafa Kemal Ataturk on the Armenian Genocide of 1915 by Fatma Ulgen, which is a complete collection of what Ataturk said to, you know, foreign uh, journalist to what he said to his friends and so forth. And <laughs> uh, I can assure you, he had actually a very much, a very much uh, pro unionist view about what happened. So, again, throughout the video, uh, he tries to disconnect Ataturk with, you know, Talat Pasha, Jamal Pasha, and Enver Pasha. Now, I agree that Ataturk had some kind of, uh, you know, I guess beef, you might say, with Enver Pasha, but he was still very much pro Talat Pasha. He was still very, mo very much uh, pro Jamal Pasha, and his entire party consisted out of unionists. So this is also something that you see in the Turkish Republic. I mean, like most of the people that made up the leadership of the Turkish Republic, who founded the Turkish Republic, you might say, were actually unionists. I mean, like, if you watch his video, I mean, apparently Ataturk even wasn't a Union Turk, but, I mean, if you actually read history books, um, you will realize that most of the founders of the Turkish Republic were indeed unionists. And large point of this agreement between Mustafa Kemal and the Young Turks. And that disagreement was probably the biggest one, one with which Mustafa Kemal was also largely ahead of his time. He didn't believe that the empire should continue. He believed that the age of empires and colonialism was coming to an end. He also rejected ideas like Enver Pasha's Turanism, the idea of a pan-Turkish empire stretching from China to the Balkans as fantasies and delusions. I mean, the idea that Ataturk was against uh, Enver Pasha and so forth, because he was an anti-imperialist and they were pro-imperialist is also completely nonsense. Um, well, I mean, he did indeed. First of all, we have to understand that Ataturk and Enver Pasha, Jamal Pasha and Talat Pasha were all of the same party. You know, they were all members of the Committee of Unity and Progress. Now, what actually happened after the First World War is that, you know, the Committee of Unity and Progress with Enver Pasha on, on the top had become so unpopular by the local population. I believe that even German soldiers had to, you know, protect their headquarters in uh, Constantinople uh, because the local population was so tired and exhausted of the war. So after, you know, after the First World War, the Turkish population or what was left over it was obviously not in the mood for another, you know, for another independence war. And this is why actually uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk comes into play because he was actually a fresh face and uh, not associated with, you know, the Enver Pasha itself. I mean, he was part of the party, but he was seen as, he was essentially seen as loyal because he was part of the party, but he was also seen as not dangerous because he wasn't really high up, you know, high up in the ranks, uh, in the CUP ranks. So that's the reason why, you know, like, Ataturk played also a show, you know, like uh, during the Independence War, he also said like, um, you know, what happened in the First World War was bad, um, you know, the policies regarding it, or he also made like commentary which, you know, promoted or promoted pan-Islamism. He also made uh, statements that supported Bolshevism, but I mean like, Regarding Ataturk's role in uh, the independence here, there should be actually a separate video about it because it's actually a quite compl complicated subject because there are a lot of factors into play and so forth. But essentially, what I, the point that I'm trying to make is um, Ataturk was not really, you know, apart or divided or separated from the Committee of Unity of and Progress as uh, Crouch constantly tries to pretend he was. This quote is, by the way, a fake one, just like most of his quotes on Islam. This is not to say that Ataturk was necessarily pro-Islamic or anti-Islamic, but there are no confirmed quotes or sayings from him that we know about what he thought about Islam. Taxes for non-Muslims, no more restrictions of freedoms, no more prohibition of alcohol, no more punishments for apostasy or other. He introduced freedom of consciousness, making it possible for Muslims to convert to other faiths or even openly leave their faith and be open atheists. Marriages between faiths and lack of faiths were now legal without a spouse being forced to convert as it would have been under Sharia. 
mixed faith couples could now raise children together, which was forbidden under Sharia. The Islamic at this point, you'd be thinking that at least near the end of the video, he wouldn't, he wouldn't make such like ridiculous mistakes, but apparently he makes them still. So, I mean, like the capital punishment for apostasy was, you know, already abolished during the Tansumat. Uh, same with the extra taxes. Um, yeah, no more restrictions on freedoms. I mean, the ultimate, you know, the Turkish Republic under Ataturk was absolutely not a liberal or libertarian paradise. I mean, it was very much first and foremost a nationalist republic that didn't necessarily look up to the United States or whatever. And regarding the alcohol, alcohol was even produced amongst the Ottomans. So, I mean, like, even that is, he is wrong on it. After him would be safe, Ataturk established a National Security Council, an institution of generals that had the expressed permission to intervene in the politics of the country by force if the constitution of the secular republic was ever under threat of being undermined. Ataturk didn't create the National Security Council, it was created after the 1960 coup and also Ataturk disliked the military role in politics, so again that's also one that is wrong.